thing about Chief Justice Dixon is that he was a veteran of the Second World War. He'd had his leg blown off. He was a very reassuring presence. And so people can criticize judges and academics and native leaders, but an old soldier with his leg blown off, well, that's somebody whose judgment you could trust. <laughs> so there was an extraordinary acceptance. You know, if Chief Justice Dixon said, look, these people have had a terrible deal, and I am going to lead the court to put it straight in a series of very important uh, decisions. There was a general acceptance, but of course people on the ground didn't realize the implication of what the Chief Justice was talking about. And it wasn't until decisions of the court actually had an effect on the ground so that suddenly people said, hey, maybe this means that the land that we thought belonged to the province doesn't belong to the province. Maybe that the First Nations people can keep fishing when the rest of us aren't allowed to fish. It may be that there are rights to oil or to copper, which we didn't think the native people had. But the Supreme Court seems to be making decisions which put all of these things uh, at risk so far as the non-Aboriginal society was concerned. And so the notion of the, five minutes, the notion of the, uh, of reconciliation which had begun with get used to it and emerged into reconciling Aboriginal society and the crown and the dominant society began to evolve. And it began to evolve into what a case called Sparrow in 1990 said was the promise of Section 35. It was more than simply a recognition of historic grievances. It was more than recognizing that uh, under Treaty 6, uh, the First Nations were entitled to a medicine chest. It was the broader notion that somehow Canada had to be made to work, and an important part of that was to reconcile on a community basis what uh, uh, the, 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 the peaceful and mutually supportive and mutually amenable uh, relations. I think what has emerged over the last few years is that as the dominant society, the non-Aboriginal society, for example in British Columbia, have become to see that the law is serious about promoting this reconciliation, this vision of reconciliation, and as people have recognized that these rights have real meaning, have real bite, have real significance, that the non-Aboriginal governments are beginning to move uh, towards making treaties, towards giving serious effect in their legislation to the rights of Aboriginal peoples, and have abandoned this notion that somehow the whole issue can be ignored uh, and it will uh, go away. So that uh, is the sort of background to, uh, in the legal sense, uh, of what we're talking about today when we speak of, of reconciliation. I think in the time since uh, we argued Regina and George in 1965, Canada has moved an immense distance Aboriginal peoples as part of Canada have moved an immense distance and the non-Aboriginal communities have done so as well. The question really before the symposium is how do you carry it forward uh, from this point so that reconciliation becomes less a visionary goal and more a reality. Thanks very much.